уважаемые коллеги. Colleagues, my name is Sergey Masayadov. I'm vice rector of uh, RANEPA. We are extremely lucky today because uh, today we'll be watching uh, an exciting lecture, standing lecture by a unique personality. Thank you. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you for the applause. I'm extremely lucky. I've been moderating uh, Monsieur Nigovskoy for a third time, and I'm still fascinated, although I'm a professor myself. She's an amazing person, and since I have the mandate, I'd like to ask a question completely out of the blue, and it's a personal question. About 30 years ago, I was doing a retraining at Wharton Business School in Pennsylvania. So it was a top executive program, and we spent two months, five days a week, We were given about 800 pages to read before the next day at about 6 p.m. There were cases, math, exercises, some general articles. A week passed, and I realized I can't do more than 30 to 40 pages with a pen. So I went to, you know, to voice my grievances to Mr. Antonio Santanera. Tony! This is methodically incorrect. I'm a professor myself. No, you cannot let people read 850 pages. You just can't read and digest it. And here's what Tony told me. Now, Sergey, we are training top managers. And a top manager always facing a dilemma. They cannot digest all the information flows. You don't need to read 150 pages. You just need to read what you need next day. But I don't know what I'm going to need the next day. I don't know what you're going to train. Well, just train your managerial intuition, your sixth sense. Well, Mr. Nigevska, you're the world's leading specialist and chief neurobiologist of our country. Do you think intuition can help us peruse 850 pages and pick the best, or is it complete? Nonsense. What about intuition? Does it play any key role? Any major role? Well, I'll talk about that during my statement. But I know what I can tell you. I'm sure you do. I have got a friend in the US who is head of a major cardiac surgery clinic in Long Island. A top class expert, top notch expert. So he got his uh, doctorate degree at uh, Harvard and I asked him, John, how did it happen? How did he study? Three days, 24-7, you are on duty with patients who've got, uh, uh, who had a failing heart. So you, don't, you can't sleep. And in the morning, you have a seminar. And the, uh, the person who, uh, ran, uh, that, who ran that seminar would say, what, uh, is there any new research on your topic? And uh, you would only say, no, no, I saved five people from death. And the answer would be, well, if you cannot uh, handle the pressure, if you ha can't handle the workload, goodbye. You are not a kind of surgeon. surgeon. So my second question was, what would you say uh, after that, and he said, now, after that torture in Harvard, there is no emergency that can confuse me. Well, that's my first part of the question. The second part of the question, there's the sadists. They're definitely sadistic people, you know. So they're trying to lead you in an absurd kind of situation. And the third part of my response would be on intuition. Einstein, not a poet, not a composer, not a designer or an artist. So Einstein said, intuition is a sacred gift, godsend gift. And the second one is that uh, your reason is just an obedient servant 
So knowledge is limited. We can only know that far. And when you have something that goes beyond that perimeter, we're not aware of that. But intuition, inspiration, and things like that, these special states, you know, whenever it doesn't matter how we call them. They give us the freedom to enter any realm. There are no boundaries there. So this is why AI won't be able to discover anything. They can only make technical discoveries. What I mean by technical? Well, no person can digest such a vast arrays of uh, data that AI can do. But a real discovery like Eureka, out of the blue, it can only be done by a human. So that's my long answer. Thank you very much, ma'am. Tatiana, I'm not going to ask you any questions, so the floor is yours. <laughs> is it on? Can you hear me? Uh, I'm sorry, it's a professorial habit. I cannot deliver while I'm sitting. So, with your permission, I'm going to stand. So, uh, that's how I'm calling it civilization shift or a fracture of civilizations, whether neuron, neurons, sorry, and social networks are going to sustain it. And I'm actually saying this without any pump. Lots of people, including myself, believe that we're living in a time that is, well, effectively totally unprecedented. Well, first, we've seen through lots of technological changes. Well, we first had donkeys and horses and then cars take us around the place. Uh, but that's not the kind of complexity I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that this is a diff different type of civilization we're looking at now. And actually, nobody has a response for that. Uh, that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. So what you see over there is a small chunk of a neural network. And that's us reading our newspaper for God knows what reason, without even caring to, you know, look back and say what's encroaching on us. Now, we are incredibly complex beings. So people keep claiming that this is a very complex world, it's a VUCA world, it's difficult to, you know, plot our way in it. But, you know, what well, has been like this always? The level of complexity has not changed. The world has always been complicated. Now imagine you're in the jungle. You, are, you no longer have any formidable claws or a very handy tail. And you're actually naked, so there is no fur to protect you. But there are also a huge hairy base around you that see you as a very attractive lunch. This is a very stressful situation, although you may also have ideas about them being your lunch. So in this ambiguous environment, and it is ambiguous, well, it's always been ambiguous. But there are differences. First is the different pace of change. Changes are happening so fast that we don't really get to get used to uh, the recent changes when new ones happen. You know, computers or applications on your phone, they keep changing stuff all the time. They keep retraining you, keep telling you you need to reinstall this software. You got to learn the new arrangement of icons. I personally hate it. You know, I was very comfortable with the old arrangement of icons, and that's not because I'm some retrograde, no. But I actually hate this idea that they're imposing those unnecessary changes on me. So pace of change has picked up. But that's not the worst of it all. The worst of it all is that nobody really observes any previous contracts or compacts. Now imagine two global leaders or international leaders uh, have a meeting, they come to an agreement, and next morning one of them claims, you know what, after a good night's sleep, I took a second thought on whatever I promised to you. You know what, societies cannot exist like this, you know, we need rules. Even bad rules are better than no rules. You cannot really tolerate as a society, you cannot really tolerate ever-changing rules. It's not okay to start playing a nice hockey game and end up playing poker. 
But that's what exactly ha that's exactly what's happening here. You know, events and things start misbehaving. So if you haven't read Alice in Wonderland for some time, please reread it. And if you're so lucky you've never read Alice in Wonderland, you know, I really envy your position. Please take my word for it. Alice in Wonderland is a profound philosophical and um, how do I shall, shall I call it? It's a philosophical book with uh, some providential power to it. So, absolutely, you must read it. So, for example, Alice finds this uh, pie, and it really doesn't know which part of the, which side of the pie to bite, because, you know, if she gets it wrong, that she will get bigger instead of getting smaller. So, in this new norm, in this new reality, we are losing our previous capabilities, our previous means for checking what's true, what's not. Now, there was a conference organized by RT, TV channel, and, you know, journalists talked about uh, our potential responses to fake news, not the fake news that were, uh, you know, maliciously generated to be fake news, but, you know, just things that turned out to be bogus. You know what? We all have this huge, formidable neural networks in our brains. Even the dumbest among us have it. If you actually stretch it in a single thread, it will be 2. Point million kilometers long, which is 68 uh, times longer than the circumference of the Earth, or like seven times the trip from the Earth to the Moon. The number of connections, the synaptic connections, is slightly north of a quadrillion. And most people don't even know what a quadrillion is. That's how bad it is. You know, when I was doing my PhD, I was thought, now let's assume there are five types of neurons. It doesn't really matter, matter how many of them there. You know what? We were told five, maybe ten. Now it turns out there is a thousand varieties. Moreover, I learned half a year ago they can actually be in different states. You know that? I'm depressed from that moment on. And again, it's not just two states they can be in. Five. Now, I don't really want to do the math on this, because I understand the number will be really colossal. Okay. This is stuff that I... Uh, I don't think I've actually talked about it, but everybody knows the Dunbar number, right? I actually learned about the Dunbar number relatively recently. So the Dunbar number tells you the average number of social connections a brain can maintain. It's pretty much driven by the size of the brain, more or less. Now, apes are different, but for apes, the Dunbar number is around 50. Uh, these are distant connections, and there will be like three or four connections on average with your closest circle. Given the size of our brain, we can maintain like 150 distant connections and 12 to 15 really close ones. Now check your phone. How many people do you have in your phone book? We're talking thousands. Can we actually weather that? Are we hardwired for it? Well, you must have noticed that the key word for the 21st century is networks. You know, we're seeing networks everywhere. Networks of networks? Networks of networks of networks? Networks to the power of N? So many hyper-networks in the brain. No serious scientist today We'll be looking for, you know, highly specialized areas of brain, like spoon area or like fork area in your brain. Obviously, it doesn't work that way because it's a, it's a convoluted network and it keeps changing and rehashing itself all the time. It's not a cellar. It's not a library. It's a living, breathing, ever-changing entity. How can you even attempt to study it? 
you know, I, I happen to work for the Institute of Human Brain, so I'm exposed to it on a daily basis. You know, every time we start an experiment, we are painfully aware that we don't have enough brain power to study human brain. You know, we even have this joke that, you know, our brain, you know, the brains that we have are not rigged to enable us to study our own brains. So, we're all exposed to all sorts of networks all the time. It's not really clear how these networks work and how long we can sustain it. No, I understand you are professionals, even if you aren't. We are still exposed to all this stuff, right? So the people you're dealing with are humans, right? But how can you be sure? Is that the same person? Like, uh, say, John Smith you're talking to today. Is that the same John Smith that was yesterday? Maybe we're dealing with like 300,000 different Johns. I've long been saying that there is no profession more important in the 21st century than that of a psychiatrist for the humankind as a whole. Moreover, with this technological advances, with this pace of change, our ethical and legal norms are no good anymore. I'm sorry, I don't have time to go into details, so just take a simple example from it. Now, we have heard that there was a lethal case in Florida involving a self-driving car. So who is responsible? Is it the manufacturer of the car, the software engineer, the insurance company, the owner of the car? I can go on like this forever. What kind of rules should we teach this car? It's not just the traffic rules, right? We also need to establish priorities for the car. Like, if it needs to choose in an emergency whom to save, will that be the driver, the passenger, a pedestrian? How do we distinguish between different types of pedestrians? And that's not an AI issue. That's a huge ethical and moral dilemma. And, well, I can complain and say, you know what, I'm too dumb to resolve issues like this, I wasn't lucky, you know, my parents are dumb or whatever. But equally, I can blame it all on uh, my genetics and epigenetics and say, you know what, yes, I am a criminal, but that's no fault of mine. That's because of my gene set. I'm not responsible for anything I do. Well, because there's been this research into what makes or, you know, what leads to people turning into criminals, so this sort of criminal mindset, so to speak. And this is something that, you know, lawyers and moralists know about, but there is very little being discussed. Now, Sergei Kapitsa, an outstanding Soviet uh, scientist, uh, Nobel laureate, in his later years looked very much into issues of overpopulation. And he famously said that uh, we cannot continue at this pace forever. It will end in a natural collapse, not because we will decide we uh, stop reproductive, stop having reproductive sex. You know, not a single graduate, I'm sorry, uh, one, uh, uh, one lady at Petri Shuli uh, Girls School for Girls asked me, how long do you think this increase in pace of change uh, can continue? Like, do you think it is an infinite process or eventually can turn around? I think she's very smart. I should have asked her for her name uh, to know the name of future Nobel laureate. I don't have an answer, obviously. We don't really know how to predict things like this because this is a non-linear process. Like, all the tool sets that mathematics and arithmetic uh, have developed over the last several millennia is very good for linear stuff. I don't play any games, but okay, let's imagine I'm playing backgammon, okay? Well, just for the sake of argument, assume I'm playing backgammon. So I throw my dice, and uh, I'm trying to choose a particular trajectory, and I make some intuitive choice, and I win. And then I'm asking myself, how come I have won? 
Now, I'm not making this point about who wins and who doesn't. But what I'm saying is that for so many situations in life, we have rules, and humans are pretty good at bending rules or just, you know, dodging those rules. It's uh, an important development that at the UN level, they're actually developing, elaborating now ethical norms for brain studies. But a big question here is whether we can actually regulate stuff like this. Like, UN can adjudicate and develop those norms as long as they like. However, we all realize that there can be a gentleman named Trump, for example, who will find possible to buy an island in uh, the Atlantic Ocean and will bring their outstanding scientists and give them great conditions and all the lab equipment they need so that they clone whatever they like. So we cannot really have a super system level prohibition of that. It can only work if we have an internal ban on that. You know, to quote Kant on this, you know, who talked about the critical imperative. Okay, take NGT now, or neurohacking. There are opportunities, there are technologies for that today. Like, there are thousands of people wearing implants, some of them brain implants. And indeed, we can obtain information telematically, remotely, online, about what's happening in the brain. Now, if you can read it, you can impact it. I understand it may sound provocative or that may even produce some anxiety in the audience, but this is true things. Well, the next question is the price we're paying for that. Now, many people now are extolling the virtues of online education. Now, the Asian Chinese secret on this, and this is something I personally read in several international publications, was that online education was a good thing for the poor. Now, I'm not saying it's bad, but it should not really replace offline education. You know, most experts, specialists, they learn from masters, like Leonardo had pupils, and those pupils turned out to be outstanding artists in their own right, because they had been around Leonardo for so many years. Artificial intelligence cannot do that, at least now. Secondly, we obviously need to develop the skill for agility and flexibility in children. Like, there is no point in uh, kind of, I'm sorry, uh, filling our kids with information on, uh, like, what day of the week it was when Napoleon married Josephine, because they can easily find this information in Google. However, it is incredibly important that they learn how to find whatever they're interested in and how to be able and to increase their agility. Uh, how to be able to change on a regular basis, or in a regular basis. Well, next, we need to develop the skill to live in a digital world while staying human. It's an interesting time now. Fakes today often happen to be better than the originals. This is true for the world of fine art, but this is true in some other areas as well. Artificial intelligence will not simply beat the humans, it has already beaten humans in so many areas. Like, artificial intelligence doesn't fall in love, doesn't have headaches, doesn't have hangover after Christmas, it can work 24 by 7, it has incredible memory capabilities. How are we actually trying to beat it? What are we doing here? Now we're also seeing a different type of globalization now. That's not the globalization they planned initially, which you can state, I think, pretty safely now has flopped. I am talking about a different type of organization of scientific and communicative and other activities. Okay, this is a well-known book by Philip K. Dick, Dendra's Dream of uh, Electric Sheep. Well, you probably no, if not the book, but at least the movie, Blade Runner. 
starring Harrison Ford and uh, its sequel. Very good one. It actually focuses on this question of how do you distinguish between the fake and the original, but with a twist when we're talking about fake and original people. How do you know that a particular person you're talking to is the real deal, not an ingenious piece of software? And there is no answer to this question. Well, there is also the issue of the other consciousness, and this is actually a philosophical term, other here meaning not mine. It could be that of an ant, of an alien, of a dog, or of a computer. How do you distinguish an original from a copy? You know, I have this mania now. And recently I asked the same question Piotrowski, who is the head of the Hermitage Museum. I asked him, now imagine you see a work by Durer next to an incredibly good copy. Will you be able to distinguish them? There is a condition, I say, without fancy equipment, okay? No canvas analysis, no infrared, fancy schmancy stuff, just with your naked eye. He says, for sure. And he says, you know, I have an eye for that. You know what? This is the usual answer I get from all sorts of outstanding experts. Like, you can ask, uh, say, Sviatoslav Fyodorov, you know, he's an outstanding diagnostician. And he says, I don't know, I just have an eye for that. And this is stuff you should learn. Because but make sure you talk to outstanding people, because the others will give you trivia stuff that's already in the textbooks. Okay, how do you distinguish between real reality and virtual reality? Well, there are already good goggles that give you uh, not just visual illusions, but also other perceptual illusions like smells. So, are you certain you will be able to continue without a good psychiatrist? So, cogito ergo sum, I think now, is under pressure. How about sentia ergo sum? Our ability to feel and sense may still distinguish us from artificial intelligence. Well, had I had time, I would talk more about my favorite movies. But please remember that even this stuff is so easy to imitate. It is very easy to produce a convincing copy. So how are you going to learn which it is? I'm asking all sorts of questions. I'm not giving answers. That's because there are no answers. I don't have the answers. I don't think these answers exist. Now, when we're doing artificial intelligence, well, very often we say, well, let's see how natural brains do it and let's reproduce it. That's a pretty lousy approach because there are so many other things besides algorithms in the human brain. Now, I'm showing Karsikov here. I'm not sure if he's related to the famous composer or not, but in any case, this particular Korsakov uh, worked in uh, the second half of the 19th century, and he actually produced intellectual machines ahead of Alan Turing, and uh, they were all superseded by AlphaGo. So I'm showing Einstein and Chaplin here, the two geniuses from so different walks of life. Now, one comes from the world of art, the other from uh, the world of algorithms, but they are not that different. When you reach stratospheric levels, the distinctions blur. At the level of craft, they seem to be very different. At the level of genius, they aren't. That's what Einstein states. Intuition is a holy gift, and the mind is an obedient servant. That's Einstein saying. That's not an artist, not a poet or a musician saying that. That's Einstein for you. He's a physicist, for God's sake. So he states that imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge is limited while your imagination can span the whole world, stimulating progress and promoting evolution. You know, no logarithmic ruler can give you a real invention. A supercomputer is an extension of a logarithmic ruler. 
There is no single doctor on this planet who can go through millions of X-ray images. That's where computers come in and play a very important role. However, there is still an important step required. After preliminary analysis has been performed by machines, we need a good diagnostician who will look at this stuff and make a judgment call. So, I guess some of you remember this stuff. Well, the devilishly young among us will only know it from the books, but in 1996 Kasparov was uh, devastated by Deep Blue. I said from the very beginning that was unfair. That's not how you play this game. It's unfair to demand that a human has the same kind of uh, memory capabilities and, you know, can go without rest for so long. And moreover, this particular piece of software was designed to build Kasparov. You know, it was forged as an ideal bullet for Kasparov. Well, that's unfair, if you ask me. Okay, 2006, Kromnik versus Deep Fritz. Well, I was among those who said artificial intelligence will never crack the game of Go, but you know what happened in 2016. Lisa Dahl was eliminated by AlphaGo, and that was not the end of it. So, you may remember the story. AlphaZero is an algorithm that was able to learn in a matter of 24 hours any of those games, which are pretty, you know, they require some brain power, be Go, Chess, or Sergi. And it gets so good in 24 hours that no human competitor can stand up to it. And I actually asked the designers, you know, the software engineers, how they taught it. And they said that you know, this algorithm sat down, quote-unquote, to play itself, and it plays a million games. No human can ever do that. And, you know, after one million games, it's good. Well, next, I was among those who said, no way AI can crack poker, because there is so much bluffing involved, and then AI doesn't have a poker face. See, this guy is a bluffing because they didn't see it coming. They didn't think they would be blown into smithereens by a dumb piece of software. I think it shows that we can no longer compete with artificial... Are you... Sir, are you telling me I should be winding up? Not anymore, okay. So, the point I'm trying to make is as follows. We are in a very transparent world. I think you know what I mean. Computers do know everything about us. They they know who you had lunch with, what did you eat, what you never eat and you're probably allergic to. You know, oh, what were the stupid purchases that you make and therefore what kind of ads we can now show to you. It's unstable, it's super fast, it's hybrid. And, you know, people are mixed with their copies, and truth is mixed with fakes. And it's sort of glimmering, that a shimmery, you cannot really put your finger on it. And the digital world is developing a life of its own. I think that digital reality can and will become a selection principle, a selection criterion. There will be countries that won't have access to state-of-the-art technologies, and they will be left in the ditch. There is also growing distrust in information. You know, why should we actually believe the stuff on the Internet? Fortunately for me, I'm not reading the Internet, but I have lots of friends who give, call me every day asking me, are you bonkers? What did you say in this last interview? And I say, I never said that. And they're sending me those links 
it's okay. Like I was uh, ethical. I was. Um, I'm sorry. I was prepared for them to doctor my written word, but they doctored my videos. And they even have this video where I'm talking about the difference between the brain of a millionaire versus the brain of a billionaire. You know, had I really ever given an interview like this, I should have hanged myself. And what do I do about it? Do I take those bastards to court every day? Don't they have better things to do? I can't even believe the things that I am supposed to have said myself. Like 12 sensational, groundbreaking facts about the brain from Mrs. Chernigovskaya. I never said anything like this. Okay, what kind of fears and anxieties we have? I'm trying to pick up pace here. So, now if you have children or grandchildren, remember this one. Syndrome of postponed life. That's what we keep telling our children. You do this, you do that, you're a good pupil, eventually one day you will have this. Don't, aren't they having life right now? If you have forgotten, please take it from me. Life starts when your dad's cell meets your mom's cell. From that moment on, you are having a life, not a draft of a life. We are living in a civilization of uh, mindless consumption, let me call it like this. And people often tell me, you know what, when AI wins finally, you know, beyond the point of singularity, we'll have very creative lives finally. I, I can hardly imagine it. I find it very difficult to believe that millions of people who will be jobless because of AI will surprisingly, out of the blue, start playing the lute. And what's the logic that our brains are following? You know, because uh, people developing, you know, ML, AI, they often say, well, we are replicating what the brain does. But how do we know? You know, very often when we read data coming from MRI or PET, we're making all sorts of assumptions and then we say, no, that doesn't make sense, that's not very logical. Come on, who invented logic? It seems illogical to those who are reading those images, but it may be perfectly fine for the brain itself. It may be using its own logic, there is no guarantee it's using Aristotelian logic. Now, are the laws governing what's living different from the laws governing what's not living and breathing? Are therefore we justified in applying the laws we invented for our disciplines to the living world? Well, we currently have a certain convention, but is it good? Now, brains are physical objects, they are material, and they're palpable. And tangible, they should probably be driven by physical laws. But which physics? Is that the physics of Newton, Einstein or Niels Bohr? And which laws in particular? What kind of mathematics laws drive the brain? We do have quite a lot of different mathematics to choose from. You know, I'm running workshops on uh, cognitive studies in St. Petersburg. And in a workshop, we had such a bad row, I'm surprised nobody was killed. But there was one statement there, that there is no single branch of mathematics today that would be good enough to describe what's happening in the brain. And that came from a very good expert. So let's not delude ourselves. Let's not tell ourselves that we know what's happening there. So Bohr and Einstein. Now, this were some of the best physicists this civilization has produced. So they said that physics is not about the world, is, physics is not about what the world is like, it's about what we can say about the world. Do we have any clue what the real world is like? I also like this one. No, 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 you are not really thinking. You're just expostulating logically. You know, the sheer fact that what you're saying sounds logical doesn't really prove that you're thinking or that you're thinking the right thoughts. So my questions are as follows. Can an AI develop a self 
can it become, you know, a personality, so to speak? And this is actually a major question, something that is very much debated here at Skolkova in the Silicon Valley. This is very much debated by the Department of Philosophy of Moscow State University. We are really afraid this may happen. How are we going to learn if it has happened? Is there a way we can learn about it? If it does develop a self, will it be able to feel pain? Well, maybe in the world of computers there is no pain or death. But if it does develop a self, it will be able to play along? Or to behave like a beast towards us? How have we decided? Actually, I came up with those questions yesterday. So how come we are assuming that artificial intelligence is going to, same, is going to take the same development trajectory as humans? Does it have to? You know, when we remember Asimov uh, uh, with his uh, three robotics laws and the stuff that everybody knows, Come on, artificial intelligence has no notion of what's good and what's evil. It has no notion of morality or ethics, or at least it doesn't have to have them. And in all probability, he hasn't read Asimov. Well, there are tribes in a, uh, choose a continent who, oh, I'm sorry, uh, a bad joke, but let's imagine there is a tribe somewhere where they have a ritual for eating babies on Wednesdays. And it's a time-honored ritual, they've been having it for 8,000 years. It's not good for us, though. But the same can apply to AI, and this is similar to what Stephen Hawking said. I do hope you remember your Hawking. And Stephen Hawking did say it was a very bad idea to start looking for extraterrestrial life. The best thing we can do is to hide and hope they don't find us. How come you, th you, you decided they were going to be friends with us and that they actually want to be friends with anybody? Do they thinking along these lines? There are so many other types of intelligence possible, be it natural or artificial and they can easily be based on totally different fundamental principles. Take, for example, fish or frogs. Well, they also have brains. I'm not even talking about crows. Maybe, yeah, I'm winding up, so maybe we should take a pause and consider the following. As a biological species, which is still dominating this planet, do we want to survive? And if so, we need to decide what kind of role we want to play. Like, if we want to be simply digestive mechanisms for food, well, probably there was no point being born. If we want to be beings of higher order, at least in terms of complexity, that we should at least agree that we're digging our graves here. I understand where this road is taking us. You know, machines are stealing our uh, land from us, so to speak. They're claiming our ground. Well, Sotheby's this week sold a painting for half a million euro. This painting was produced by artificial intelligence, and that was actually a good painting. You know, it was uh, not a half-ass picture of a chair. It was a portrait, and it was good. You know, it looked like something pre-impressionistic. You know, people from Skalkovo and similar institutions are proud of this stuff. They say, do you want uh, AI to produce Bach? Easy. Or Durer, or Vivaldi, or Tchaikovsky. It can produce jokes. It can already understand jokes. But if artificial intelligence does all that, what shall we do? While they're busy doing all the interesting stuff, what shall we do? So let's try not to add even more social chaos into this world that has, got, uh, has gone totally bonkers. 
I keep saying that we, as a species, as humankind, you know, we keep behaving like a 12-year-old who's got off the rail completely. You know, he's going through hormonal overload, he's developing, uh, he's uh, developing his muscles, but his prefrontal cortex is not there yet. But we are playing here with really dangerous games like our, you know, uh, nuclear bombs and stuff like this. So, this is stuff we need to prepare for. We need to develop legal and ethical norms for this new reality. We need to carve out a space for ourselves in this new environment. There is no point hiding in the cupboard. Well, there is uh, one uh, kind of uh, saving grace scenario if the whole planet explodes, AI will not dominate. But we need to come up with a different idea of how we want to live in this world. You know, very soon, children who have uh, grown up with gadgets, you know, will graduate from schools and they obviously don't need teachers who explain simple facts to them and say, well, this is a chair, it's designed for sitting. They do need training, don't get me wrong. It's just that they need totally different type of training. How are we going to educate those people? By the way, these people will be building aircraft, bridges, they will be maintaining nuclear power plants, and they will be running countries. So they won't be playing dolls forever. They will claim power pretty quickly. I am winding up now. So let me finish with this picture. I think we need to go back to what makes us human. We should stop, you know, playing this abacus competition game versus AI. Let's. Let's recognize, let's own up, we have lost it, we've lost the competition. Artificial intelligence is very good and very useful. However, we got to clip its wings. Thanks for your patience. Thank you so much. Now, our household rules uh, force us to give uh, the floor to Tim Mascot, senior vice president uh, of uh, one of the biggest associations of business schools around the world. He's uh, gone into psychology. He did uh, several books, uh, penned several books on entrepreneurship. So, does it all sound relevant uh, for the education of managers? Does it somehow relate to the education of managers? What about AI, brain studies, ethics, and morals? What role do they play in the education of managers? And then get your questions ready, Timothy. Over to you. Thank you. And I could, uh, I could listen to Tatiana uh, all day. And uh, what an honor and a privilege to sit on the same uh, panel with you. And I think we owe her one more round of applause for some incredible thought leadership around this. Thank you. She made three points that, that, I, that I will start with, if that's OK. Your, your point. First, she said, you are in the jungle. And I agree. And it's a complicated, complex jungle. And then she said, within this jungle, how do we want to live in this world? And I applaud that. She talked about change, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, how fast uh, change is occurring and that change has become the norm, not the exception in our lives today. And finally, we need rules. We need to develop skills in the digital world and yet remain human. And that's exactly what I'm going to try uh, to focus on because I think in this uh, rapidly evolving AI universe, uh, we need 
need uh, the human brain and we need AI. And I think somehow we have to learn how to balance uh, the two. I want to start with a word that was introduced by the president of uh, Northeastern University in Boston, another, like Tatiana, distinguished thought leader uh, and, uh, and humanist who argues that in the higher education world, in my world, that represents 1,700 business schools in 102 countries worldwide, uh, we must help uh, this next generation uh, develop uh, skills so that you remain employable amidst all this change. He calls this unique combination of AI, of technology uh, and data uh, and the brain, humanics. And I love this word, humanics, because it's exactly what Tatiana said. We cannot do without either. Obviously, we can't be without the brain. But Aoun argues leaders who want to be successful in the future must somehow uh, manage both. My one data point, and it's a lot like yours, uh, Tatiana, uh, Forbes magazine estimates that there are 2.5 quintillion, quintillion bytes of data generated every day. And this pace is only accelerating with the emergence of the Internet of Things. So I put that number up because it is startling. And this is data daily, daily, that we somehow process globally. And the number is only increasing geometrically. And this is what the CEO, the chief executive officer of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, this is what he said. He talks about breakthrough technologies, like, of course, artificial intelligence, AR, augmented, and VR, vir virtual reality, blockchain, and the Internet of Things. And he says, as these technologies, as Tatiana said, are interwoven into our daily lives, and they are here and only will become more prominent over time, Bezos says they change how employees and enterprises and companies work across all industries. In particular, they have the opportunity, Bezos says, to transform sectors that involve a huge percentage of knowledge work. And somehow, just what Aoun said, just what Tatiana said, this connection, this nexus between the digital and the digital world uh, must be appropriately managed. Many of you have seen McKinsey's research that is stunning on the future of work from a global perspective. And they too emphasize AI, VR, uh, AR, I, Internet of Things. And they talk about this issue that Tatiana mentioned about how many jobs will be lost. And I'm gonna not talk about it in that perspective, because we have the great ability to morph over time into other talents, other competencies, other skills, but it's about this connectivity between the brain and AI and how do we, the human side, move with these changes in the world of work. And that's a responsibility among our almost 1,700 business schools. To form this demand for new occupations related to advanced technologies, intellectualization, robotization, AI, big data, and many, many other recent inventions. I love this chart. And it looks at work in, the, in Europe and the United States. And it looks at what will change over the 15 years between 2016 and 2030. 
what we will stop doing and what we will start doing. And this says, no surprise to you, that thanks to technologies and AI, physical and manual skills and basic cognitive skills will reduce dramatically. The greatest growth is in areas of higher cognitive skills, social and emotional skills, EI, Goldman's research, and technological skills. And so we, thank goodness, as Tatiana said, the humans are at the center of this. But the workforce is changing. You know, as a dean, I had the pleasure 15 years ago of starting a neuroscience laboratory uh, for a school of accountancy, of accountancy. Why? Because we felt that human performance was going to be dramatically shifting in that world where physical, manual, and basic cognitive skills would be replaced by AI. And 15 years later, it is happening at a Malthusian pace. So the research at McKinsey suggests that in the next 15 years, the time spent devoted to advanced technological skills will increase 50% in the US, over 40% in Europe. And the fastest rise, of course, is for advanced IT programming schools, skills which may grow as much as 90% in this 15 year period. So we cannot ignore it. And when I in interact with young people today here and across Europe and the Middle East and Africa, it is dramatic to watch the shift of learning take place. Just last year, DT Global did a, a fascinating study here in, here in Russia about digital transformation and claimed that it is, it is being embraced as a major national uh, agenda uh, and priority. And they looked at, they mapped the use of big data, no surprise there. They looked at the Internet of Things and technological development, including AI, AR, and VR. And you can see the dramatic changes that are, that are indeed taking place. And the demand for digital talent, uh, which demands as well not just this reinvention of skills, but uh, enormously flexible cognitive activities. I love this. I love this inductively to look at a sector in healthcare alone. Uh, the changes are happening at an unprecedented rate. And you look, rapidly growing digital health market of an estimated 200 billion euro by the end of this year. And last week I had the pleasure of watching a Da Vinci surgical procedure where the patient was in one hospital and the surgeon was 5,000 kilometers away. And it was fast, it was efficient, it was successful, and it provided access for surgical care to a patient of a type of care that was unavailable in her country. And I will talk just briefly about that as I, as I wrap things up. In my own organization a few years ago, we began a deep dive look into artificial intelligence as it relates to the world of business education and for our students, this topic on the future of work. And we said, AI has the potential to enhance, and Tatiana talked about it, I'm gonna reference in a moment, not just online learning, but also adaptive learning software and research processes in ways 
very important that more intuitively respond and engage with students. Because as I talked about yesterday, Gen Z alone, very different from previous generations, and who knows what is next. And if we don't adapt to technologies and leveraging technologies, including AI, in the educational landscape, um, we do an amazing disservice to our students. And so my final comments. The education world will rearrange itself. It will change dramatically under this, these conditions of technological development. We will go from a design-oriented education to an experimental-oriented one. I do believe we will see much more customization of education in the future. And more of that in developed economies as here than in others. And this is very, very important. University laboratories will be very involved with this and full-scale experiments in many cases will be replaced with digitally driven simulations including AI, VR, and AR. And finally, from a strategic perspective here in your country, Digital Economy of the Russian Federation program has identified the need to increase digital literacy dramatically over the next four years. Been many strategic initiatives leveraging the technological development, looking at tracking digital skill profiles, and this is not a country issue, this is a global issue. We need a blockchain-driven repository to track these profiles so that you can build your competencies over time and there's a manner of tracking these in effective mode. And of course, what's been so wonderful here is this connectivity with the corporate world as well. And then finally, I want to reference online education and not that it's, it's, uh, it is the ultimate resolution to educational challenges, but one of the topics that I'm keenly focused on related to AI is access to education. Access, all right? Now in developed countries like here, where you have an incredible array of very sophisticated universities, some of the finest business educators in the world, access is, is a simpler topic to discuss. But there are regions of this vast country where people do not have access. Earlier this week, I was in Nigeria, and I've shared with many of you my experiences there. I was visiting universities there. 200 million people in Nigeria, in a continent with the fastest growing university age population in the world, in the world. And when I go into an aula like this and sit in an economics lecture with 4,000 students, I realize access is an issue. And this is where technology will provide the, re the resolution and it will be digital and it will be driven to this. It will be smartphone directed and this micro learning platform for the developing world, the third world, is a critical resolution to educational challenges. Spasiba Bolshoi, thank you very much. Colleagues, we have time for uh, questions. Uh, we just had two amazing interventions. Now, you have time for questions. I have a question for Ms. Chernigovska. My name is Ekaterina. I'm from Russian Chinese, Russian Koreans uh, magazine. We all know that AI feeds off an information field. So it takes information, data, that's what it feeds on. 
But what about friendship, unity? What about these notions? Can humanity set an example for AI? How to be kinder to each other? Can we teach AI to be kind, to be friendly, to avoid AI turning into a an antichrist or a devil so that it could uh, destroy us all. Well, I love these uh, devil stories. Well, you made a major assumption. We might talk in such terms too, but your basic assumption was that AI already has its, this self, and so far knock on wood, has not happened. So far, AI doesn't have it. We cannot talk to it about love, friendship, or whatever. But as I said, I suddenly got an idea yesterday. We all think that everyone wants to copy us, that everyone wants to be like us. I will also have another speech to die later in the day. Imagine you have to deal with an octopus. So you have to somehow communicate with an octopus. Now, for those of you who don't know, every leg, again, they have, it, they have eight nervous systems, one for each leg. How are you going to communicate with that creature? How are you going to communicate about love? It's just an alien brain, alien consciousness. You don't talk in black and white, good or bad. No. You might remember the uh, Solaris uh, wrote, written by Lim, a uh, famous sci-fi book. Well, it's not relevant yet, but it might become relevant. We don't have an answer. So what about octopus? We often can't be on the same page with each other. On a, on a serious issue, take any talk show. OK, imagine you're insane, gone insane, and you might uh, watch some talk show, a political talk show, and I'm prone to that too. And you then, the next day, you realize this is uh, <laughs> dimwit, and that's more or less. But then you would talk to a person who's watched the same, and he would tell you, no, it's the opposite. So what are you going to do with it? We cannot find common ground within our own biological species. Different cultures have different perspectives. What about communication gaps? I mean, communication gap is a hard, cold fact. So what about other biological species? OK, I urge my students to talk to insects. What, was, uh, what happened earlier? What was before uh, spirit or substance? My name is Yevgeny Babich. I used to be one of the youngest heads of, uh, uh, youngest officials in Russia, but now I'm an entrepreneur. So here's a question to you. How soon can AI replace officials? public administrators. And my second question to you is what you think is happiness? Happiness, well, 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 when a, your relatives are uh, healthy and prosperous, and when you are more or less yourself, when you are not driven apart by internal demons. Well, that's the uh, most complicated question, but the answer is uh, the simplest one. Uh, what about officials? Well, my colleague, who I think is more placed to reply to that. 
But from what I think, formally, it can happen very soon. I think the UK precedent law is a very good thing, because that's the way it should do according to the rules. But actually, you have to, you know, feel mercy for that woman. You know, she could be knitting socks, but she became a prostitute, you know. Yeah, and, and let me say, Sergei, worldwide, uh, on the happiness topic, the psychology of happiness courses at universities around the world are among the most popular courses. At Harvard University, the course Psychology of Happiness, which was taught by an Israeli Tal Ben Shahar, was the largest enrolled course at the university. It's a topic that young people today, and you're still young, very young, they want to talk about and they want to understand. So very important issue. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот все интересно, но вы меня Well, it's all very exciting, but I was confused. You say that people won't be able to do creative cognitive work. I think this is the uh, sigma and omega. No, I didn't say that. Uh, I just doubt, you know, that I don't think that people would suddenly start spending all of their time on uh, movie making or painting, composing music, and everyone become Vivaldi or Fellini. No. And my colleague did an excellent uh, report. You know, those circles. That, that's what I want you know to take. Uh, I'd like to get that slide from you, Timothy. This is a, actually a very good insight. If we are so foolish to become a mold, well, who you can complain to? I think this is a great insight. Okay, if we don't need that, let's uh, do away with that. But we can go into more serious stuff. I mentioned Mr. Griff. So what does Griff say? I've got, I've got treated a lot of uh, jobs. But those people are not begging for some, begging in the street now. He's retrained them, and they're doing some more serious stuff right now. But our time is limited. We can't talk about everything. I really like those bubbles, the bubbles, the circles that you, you mentioned, Timothy. I think this is extremely important. And I really like the story that you began. Those vast sizes, quintillions, quintillions of bytes, yeah, that are produced daily. So here's what I was told by people who got information from space, who are tracking space. They say we've got a paradox. It doesn't really matter whether we have information or not. We have something, but we have no time to process it. So it's a paradox. It's a, there are quintillions, and it's almost like zero. Zero and quintillions is the same, because you don't know what to do, you don't know how to digest it. So it's a kind of a con civilization or kind of a cognitive collapse, as I would say. We don't know what to do with it, how to handle it. So take brain research, cognitive research. How many more publications do you need saying that when you use uh, English words, it's part of this brain or French uh, verbs, it's here? So, I mean, there are 50 publications like that a day of what you can conjugate where, but there's a, that's a, a mistake. We're not interested in what is where, because it might be today here, and it might be in another lobe tomorrow. And it's different, it varies between people. We just need to understand what's happening in the brain in general. It's not where it's located, where friendship is. No, we need to understand the basic framework, the, the arrangement within. How does this machine handle, how can this machine handle everything? And the brain doesn't forget anything. We might forget it, we, but the brain will remember that. Yeah. No, a good, uh, 
a good therapist could help you recall all of that. Uh, but I hope that won't happen. One more question. Raisa Bagachava from Ney Robotics, educational robot robots, and I see some people nodding. So what about biological feedback? Can we use robots in education? Do you think it can make the process more effective? Well, that was a question to Timothy. And, well, I'm an amateur. I'm not a specialist in education, but I think, yes, we could use that. There are people with this attention deficit syndrome. Use that feedback, right? Use that feedback mechanism, and it's been successful. It means that it does work, so you can somehow fine-tune yourself. You can somehow, you know, change the state. And, but it, I'm not a specialist in treated in a neutral way. Well, fortunately, our time has run out. But, but, well, somehow people in the theater applaud when standing, give a standing applause. Let's uh, treat our researchers to the same ovation. 